Good morning, church. It's great to be with you again um, this weekend. Uh, man, uh, I love being here. This is, uh, IES has become a real home church to my wife and I as we uh, travel throughout Southeast Asia and Indonesia. Uh, man, we love coming to, to IES. So it's great being with you guys um, again. This is two weeks in a row for me. Uh, Kasihan, you guys, right, have to listen to me again. Wow, this over-caffeinated boule, right? So uh, great to be here, though, with you guys. My name is Jamie Kemp. My wife and I, we lead a, a, a ministry in uh, Joe Jakarta, working with unchurched university students there. And so it's a great honor and privilege to be back here at IES this weekend again. And really what we do in Jogja is um, we're kind of a, we're an extension of, of what you guys are doing here in Jakarta. We consider ourselves kind of a, a younger brother or younger sister ministry of what you guys have established here in Jakarta. And so we're, uh, we're so grateful to be connected with you guys. And so thank you to Pastor Dave and the leadership, the deacon board, and the, the pastoral staff for the, the opportunity to, uh, to be with you guys again this weekend. And so um, I can remember when I first moved to, uh, to Indonesia about six years ago, um, we live in Jakarta right now, but when we first moved here, we spent our first year living in this small town in central Java called Salatiga. And that was a, an interesting year because we had, uh, I've grown up in Chicago in the States a rather large city. So to move from Chicago to this little Kota Kachil, you know, in, uh, in, in central Java, you know, where there's only one KFC, you know, man, that's a tough transition to make, all right? And so I can remember uh, after a few months of living there, we were making the transition between uh, uh, between rainy, or between the hot, well, hot season, it's always hot here, between dry season and rainy season, all right? That transition was happening, and, and it was maybe the third day of rainy season, of rain every day, um, and I, I remember uh, my wife wife and I were laying in bed and we hear this noise in the attic above our above our bed we hear like a and we think oh man i think i think we have a rat in our attic, you know, and so we wake up the next morning and we talk to our neighbors and we were living in just a small little kampung in Salatiga, about the size of this stage, real small house, and our neighbors tell us, you know, we're like, I, I, I think we have a rat living in our attic, and, uh, and our neighbors say, well, of course you have a rat in your attic, it's rainy season, all the rats are coming inside now, and we're like... No, 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 <laughs> like, like, we're not looking for a pet, we're not looking for a roommate, you know, we need to take care of this problem, right? And so, so I go to our little hardware store in that little town, and, and you know, I'm looking to buy some sort of rat trap or mouse trap, something to like, whoosh, you know, like take care of the problem, kill the rat for me, but uh, they didn't have anything like that there. They had, um, they had, I'd never seen this before, they had a glue trap, all right? I mean, perhaps you know what that is, and, and what it is, it's about... Uh, it's about 18, it's a piece of cardboard, maybe 18 inches by 18 inches, you know, a third of a meter by a third of a meter, um, uh, with crazy super sticky glue on it, all right? And so what you do is you buy this thing, and you put a little peanut butter, bloop, right there in the middle of it, and then you uh, you put it in the attic, and, the, and it catches the, it attracts and catches the rats. And so I'm like, I'll take all you got. You know, I'm going to buy as many as I can. We're going to line the whole attic with these things, all right? So I buy a bunch of them. I go up in the attic, and I, I, I put them out, and bloop, 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 peanut the butter on it and then and then we go to bed and sure enough that night we hear it we hear like a help me help me help me i'm like aha we got it all right and so so i hop out of bed I, I put on like a hoodie and a scarf and gloves you know because i don't know if like when i go up there the rats are gonna be like get him you know and like counter attack you know monty python me all right so you know i'm a, I, I i get all bundled up with my armor and i get out the ladder climb up the ladder and i peek into the attic and there it is an ugly looking rat you know with the big nose and the tail and and so i so i i, I grab the 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 glue trap and i put it in a, a garbage bag, I tie up the garbage bag, I go down the ladder, and, and that's as far as I'd thought through my plan, because right now I've got a rat stuck to glue in a bag, all right, I'm like, what am I going to do with this thing now, and my wife's behind me going, kill it, kill it, you know, and I'm like, with what, she's like, with this brick, you know, and so, uh, so I take the brick and I couldn't do it. I didn't have the, the, the courage to do it. So I, I opened up our garage door, and I, I, I put the bag behind the back tire of my car. I start up the car, and I put it in reverse and just kind of back right over it, come back. 
I can't feel the judgment I feel here this morning. I guarantee if you've got a rat in your house, you're doing whatever you can to take care of the problem, right? And so, you know, we smooth it out, right? We flatten it out, right? And so, uh, so now I feel very comfortable throwing the rat away. Now, no problem. It's in heaven now. And so, um, so we take care of that. We go back to bed, and about two hours later, we're awoken to the same sound. Another like, help me, help me, help me. You know, we got another one, and I'm, I, I get out of bed, and I'm not nearly as enthusiastic this time getting out of bed. It's like 2 in the morning. I get up. You know, hoodie goes on, scarf goes on, gloves go on. I, I get out the ladder, up the ladder, and there it is, another rat, about the size of a, of a small football, you know. And, I, and I'm like, oh, man, just ugly-looking thing, not cute at all like Ratatouille, you know. And so, so I, I, I grab the glue trap, put it back in the garbage bag, tie up the garbage bag, back down the ladder. I'm like, man, I don't want to go through the hassle of getting out the car again and smushing this thing and so so my wife Tasha she's like well let me see it so I, I give Tasha the bag she takes the bag she puts the bag on the ground picks up a brick and bam smashes it just like that I'm like no way did she just do that uh, I'll be handing in my man card now you know <laughs> like I won't be needing this any longer you know so you know I couldn't believe that she did that she, she had the courage to do that and, and I was thinking you know sometimes in life all we need is about 20 seconds of insane courage, right, to get things done. Sometimes we need 20 seconds of insane courage. And I remember hearing that line in a movie. Uh, perhaps you remember that movie, We Bought a Zoo, starring Matt Damon some years ago. And, and I remember hearing him say that line, that sometimes all you need is 20 seconds of, an insane, of insane courage. And that's just that that's not just a great line from a film. I mean that's that's that can change the plot of your life. You know, 20 seconds of insane courage. You know, that's that's all it takes. History happens with a defining decision that takes about 20 seconds of insane courage or or insane faith. If you have the courage to take one step of faith and climb a cliff, it will change your life forever. That's about how long it took me to surrender my life to Jesus as a 17-year-old. I remember being invited to a youth camp, and, and the invitation, my, my heart and my life were far from Jesus. But I was given that invitation at the end of a, at the end of a kabaktian, at the end of a, of, a, of a worship service. Given that invitation to follow Jesus, and I knew I should make that decision, and, and it, I just needed that 20 seconds of insane courage to stand on my feet and respond to the challenge, the, uh, the invitation to follow Jesus with my life. That's about how long it took me to call Tasha, my wife, for the first time to ask her out on a date. You know, that 20 seconds of insane courage of putting her, her phone number into my hape and then, and then calling her, you know, that, that, that moment of I'm going to just go for it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to step out and give her a call. And she said yes. So, whew, all right. That's how long it took to say yes to opening an English center in the city of Joke, Jakarta, rather than, than, than starting a church like so many people expected us and wanted us to do. 20 seconds of insane courage can change your whole life. That's all it takes. So this morning, let's wrestle with this question, these, these questions. Let's have a discussion about, about what difficult decision do you need to make? What tough conversation do you need to have? Or, or what crazy risk do you need to take? Let's see what the Bible has to say about this. I want to read a story from the scriptures from, from 1 Samuel chapter 14. It's a familiar story, 1 Samuel 14. And perhaps you've heard it before, and it's a little bit lengthy, but I want to read it to us and then kind of look for some things, some principles that we can pull out of it to figure out how can we have this, this 20 seconds of insane courage of faith to step out and follow and make the right decisions that God wants us to make with our life. It says this in 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 1. One day Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come on, let's go over to where the Philistines have their outposts. But Jonathan did not tell his father what he was doing. Meanwhile, Saul and his 600 men were camped out on the outskirts of Gibeah, around the pomegranate tree at Migron. No one realized Jonathan had left the Israelite camp. To reach the Philistine outpost, Jonathan had to go down between two rocky cliffs that were called Bozes and, and Sena. The cliff on the north was in front of Michmash, and the one on the south was in front of Geba. Let's go across the outpost to those pagans, 
Jonathan said to his armor bearer. Perhaps the Lord will help us, for nothing can hinder the Lord. He can win the battle, whether, there are, whether he has many warriors or only a few. Do whatever you think is best, the armor bearer replied. I'm with you completely, whatever you decide. Now, man, that's a great friend, huh? All right, then, Jonathan told him. We will cross over and let them see us. If they say to us, stay where you are or we'll kill you, then we will stop and not go up to them. But if they say, come on up and fight, then we will go up. That will be the Lord's sign that he will help us defeat them. When the Philistines saw them coming, they shouted, look, the Hebrews are crawling out of their holes. The men from the outpost shouted to Jonathan, come on up here and we'll teach you a lesson. Come on, climb right behind me, Jonathan said to his armor bearer. For the Lord will help us defeat them. So they climbed, using both their hands and feet, and the Philistines fell before Jonathan, and his armor bearer bearer killed those who came behind them. They killed some 20 men in all, and their bodies were scattered over about a half an acre. Suddenly, panic broke out in the Philistine army, both in the camp and in the field, and including the outposts and the raiding parties. And just then an earthquake struck, and everyone was terrified. The story ends like this in verse 23. So the Lord saved Israel that day. Let's talk about this. What does it mean to have this 20 seconds of of insane faith, of insane courage? And, And sometimes one snapshot of one moment of a person's life is kind of a character. It gives us an image of what that person's life and character is really like. And that is this moment for the king for King Saul, for the person of Saul. You read verse 2, it says, Saul was staying at the outskirts of Gibeah, under the pomegranate tree in Migron, with, with, with about 600 men. Can't you just imagine Saul snacking on the seeds while reclining in the shade of a pomegranate tree? I bet some of the lower-ranking privates in the army were even fanning him to help him stay cool. Instead of picking a fight with the enemy, the leader of Israel's army is picking pomegranates. And it shouldn't come as a surprise because Saul has a long history of letting other people fight his battles for him. Saul is what I would call a rim hugger. But his son Jonathan was anything but that. Jonathan was a cliff climber. Their polar opposites approach to the same situation is diametrically different that it's hard to believe that they come from the same gene pool. Saul was playing not to lose, but Jonathan was playing to win. And that's the difference between fear and faith. And that's the difference between fear and faith. If we let fear dictate our decisions, we'll always live defensively, reactively, cautiously. But living by faith is playing offense with our life. It's the difference between holding out on God and going all in with Jesus. 20 seconds of insane courage. And I think that's a better description than Jonathan. Uh, I think that's a better description of Jonathan picking a fight with the Philistines. It was crazy, but when God is in it, it's holy crazy. When God is with us, it's holy crazy. Don't be surprised if people mock you or criticize you or laugh when you do something crazy for Jesus. In fact, if you're not being criticized, it's cause for concern. People may think you're crazy when you climb a cliff, but the alternative to that is to let them think that you're just normal. I mean, is that your highest aspiration and inspiration in life, is to just be normal? I mean, no little kid grows up and says, I just want to be normal when I grow up, right? You know, my son, my youngest son, he's, he's three years old, and if you ask him, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? He says, I want to be Batman, you know? Like, like he, doesn't say, he doesn't say, oh, I can't wait to just be normal, you know? I just want to, this normal life, this easygoing life. You know, when did, when did it become our aspiration as followers of Jesus to be normal, you know, is that, the, is that the, the goal of the Christian life, of the follower of Jesus, to just say, I just want a normal life? Call me crazy, but normal is the last thing I want to be. So what motivated Jonathan to climb this cliff? What triggered this 20 seconds of insane courage? What helped him overcome his fear? Well, let me give us some background and set the scene to what's been happening here. During the early years of, of Saul's kingship, the Philistines controlled the western border of Israel. 
and the battle lines were drawn at a place called Michmash. Saul seemed content to sit on the sidelines, but Jonathan, he wanted to be on the front lines. Jonathan said, come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. And going all in for God always starts with one step of faith. Oftentimes, it's the longest and hardest and scariest step. When we make the move that is motivated by God's glory, it moves the heart and hand of God. And that's what it means to be going all in with God, that, that taking that step of faith, that, that calling that God's put on your life, whether it be to follow Jesus with your life or make that business decision or that family decision. It's that first step of faith takes that, that 20 seconds of insane courage to step out. It's often the hardest, the scariest, and the longest step that we have to make. But there comes a time in our life where we say enough is enough. The pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of changing. We reject the status quo and we re refuse to remain the same. Change isn't easy. Change is always difficult. Change can be painful and, 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 is, and, is, and is hard to do. I can remember when Tosh and I first began dating, when we, when we were dating, I'd, I'd just graduated graduate school and I was getting a, a paycheck for the first time and I didn't know what to do with my money so I bought a small little house and, and I still remember in that house, I didn't have enough money after buying the house to have any furniture. So the first thing and the only thing I bought was a big screen TV, right? You know, it sounds like a bachelor, right? So I had this big screen TV but no furniture. So I'd eat my meals on the floor, you know, I had friends over and we'd watch movies, but all sitting on the floor. And so I, I can remember, though, while we were dating, one of my favorite things to do was uh, before bed, I would always watch about uh, a half hour, an hour of sports before I would go to sleep. It would always help me relax and kind of unwind after a hard day. So while we were dating, I would, I would oftentimes, I would drive Tasha home and we'd say goodnight and then I, I would drive back to my house and I would sit down and watch about a half hour of sports or ESPN, something to just kind of chill. And Tasha always knew that I enjoyed watching sports. Tasha always knew that I liked watching sports. But, uh, but when we got married... And it was time for bed. Tasha would be like, all right, it's time to go to sleep. It's time for bed. And, and, and I'd be like, okay, Tasha, good night. And I, I'd give her a kiss good night. And then I would start heading towards the couch to, to watch my sports. And Tasha was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I thought it was time to sleep. I'm like, yeah, it's time to sleep, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go watch some sports. And this kind of, as you can imagine, as a new married couple, this begins to create a little tension or a little stress because Tasha really valued quality time, going to bed at the same time. But for me, I enjoyed watching sports, kind of unwind, unwinding. And so Tasha, if you ask her, she's, she'll always say, she'll say, before we were married, I knew Jamie liked sports. After we got married, I realized he really, really likes sports, all right? And so it was this new revelation for Tasha in our marriage. And then all of a sudden, I realized as a new husband that, that, that Tasha really, uh, she really valued going to sleep at the same time time. And so I had to make some sort of difficult decision, at least difficult for me, a change in our marriage had to happen because we didn't want to keep living with this tension and this, this nightly disagreement about when to go to sleep. And so, so I had to make this lifestyle change, this, this choice to make a change in, in, in our marriage. And so now I understand that it's better for our marriage for us to go to sleep at the same time. It wasn't an easy thing for me to do, but I, I value Tasha and our marriage more than watching sports, all right? Now with our, with our, uh, our, uh, our work that we're doing in Indonesia, we've gotten some great traction and I've got opportunities and I, and I found myself this year traveling quite a bit all over the country of Indonesia and Southeast Asia. I've got these incredible doors after all these years have opened up. But a couple of months ago, I was sitting in a parent-teacher conference with my oldest daughter's uh, teacher. And the teacher remarked to me, she said, uh, Mr. Kemp, have you, been, have you been traveling more this semester? I said, yeah, I've been, I've been gone quite a bit. And she goes, yeah, Tasha, or, uh, Phoebe um, had mentioned something in class, that daddy's not home a lot. Ooh man, that one hurt when I heard that one. And so now, Tasha and I, my wife and I, are in these discussions that we've got to make a serious choice with our career. That, that even though we have all these opportunities and, and, and availability to, 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 to teach and, and, and do work all around Indonesia, you know what? It's probably better for my kids, my small children, that daddy's home more. 
And so it would be easy for me to just continue on with my career and my work, but the change needs to happen. So this semester, we're making some big family decisions about sticking, me sticking around more and being available and at home more and doing less travel. Will it, will it discourage the, the, the growth of our work? Absolutely, but I value my kids more than I do my career. Change isn't always easy. Tough decisions like that isn't, are, are sometimes very difficult. But you know the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. It's not easy to change, no way, but I love my wife and kids more. And some of you are in a terrible marriage situation. And you're at a breaking point. You know that the tough decisions need to be made and changes need to be made. And maybe this morning, this is your opportunity to make those changes, to make things right. Some of you have broken relationships with, 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 with loved ones or family members and friends that even if you think about them, man, your heart just breaks. It hurts on the inside. And maybe this is the morning where you need that 20 seconds of insane courage to give them the call, to contact them and make things right again. Some of you are trapped in addictions that are so painful and embarrassing that you don't know how to get out of them. And you know that you need that 20 seconds of insane courage to talk to someone, to pray for someone, to admit your wrongs and, and begin to seek what is right. And this was that moment for Jonathan. To be perfectly honest with you, it seemed like a pretty dumb plan when you read the scriptures. You know, it has to be go down as one of the worst military strategies ever. You know, he says, his strategy is this, that if they, if they call, call to us, come on up. Then we'll go up to them and we'll fight them. That'll be a sign to us that God has given us the victory. Well, you know, if I'm creating the sign from God, I'm going with something a little different. You know, I'm, my, my sign is like this. Like if they all turn around and run away, that's our sign that God's going to give us the victory, right? Or, or, you know, if they all decide to f jump off the cliff, that's the sign that God's going to give us the victory. You know, we like, we like to look for the easy signs, the clear signs, but that's what I love about this story. What I love about this character, Jonathan, is he goes for the exact opposite. He says if they, if they come to us, that will be our sign that God has given us the victory. I love it because Jonathan chooses the more difficult, the more dangerous, the more daring option that exists. When did we start believing that Jesus died to keep us safe? Ooh, that's good preaching, Jamie. Thanks, Jamie. Sometimes i got to encourage myself here, all right? You guys got to help me out a little, all right? I'm working hard up here, all right? Uh, when did we start believing that Jesus died to keep us safe? Man, could it be that Jesus died to, to, to make us dangerous? That the will of God is not some sort of insurance plan that we could have this normal life, this safe life, but perhaps... Your commitment to Jesus is actually a daring plan, a plan, a, a life of faith, taking steps of faith. I'm not sure which one's more dangerous, climbing the cliff or fighting the Philistines. There was no guarantee that Jonathan would even survive the climb. It's not like the Philistines like, like dropped him a rope or, or even made him, uh, or even if he made it to the top, Jonathan and his armor bearer were outnumbered 10 to 1. When Tasha and I were dating, you know, I was trying to think of creative date ideas for us, you know. We're trying to get to know her, and she's getting to know me. And so, so I had this idea, why don't, we, why don't we go rock climbing together, all right? And I thought that would be, a, like, a great date. You know, I'm trying to be all cool and stuff like that. And, I, you know, I'm fairly athletic, so I figure, you know, this would be a good way for me to show off, you know, how athletic I am, how strong I am, how coordinated I am. But, you know, I, if you've ever been rock climbing, you know, the first thing they do when you, when you get there is they go through this instruction, uh, the, the, these instructions on how not to die doing it, all right? I'm like, well, who, maybe this wasn't such a good idea, all right? You know, like, uh, and, and they give you this helmet, all right, a little helmet, and I'm like, you know, it's hard to look cool wearing a little bicycle helmet, right? You know, I'm trying to impress her. You know, I've got my hair all cool and stuff like that. And then i got to put on this little puny helmet, all right? And so I put that on. And then it gets more embarrassing if you've been rock climbing. They make you put on this harness, all right, around your waist. And it's the most embarrassing contraption ever made, you know what I mean? You know, it just hugs around your booty a little bit. You know, you just don't feel all that cool wearing this thing, all right? And so, so finally, we're all ready to start rock climbing. And, and Tasha's there, and I'm here and I'm flirting.
flirting with her, and she's flirting with me, and we're giggling and laughing. And, you know, I'm like, all right, this is my time to show off, you know, how cool I am. And, you know, so we get some chalk. We put it on our hands. We're ready to start climbing. And, and I look over to Tasha, and I'm like, hey, you want to race to the top? You know, I'm like, yeah, I'll show off how cool I am. And she's like, oh, Jamie, you're so cute. I'm like, ah, oh, thank you, thank you. All right, so, so, so it's time to race. I'm like, are you ready to race? She's like, sure. And I'm like, all right, here we go. On your marks, get set, go. You know, I start climbing up. Little did I know that Tasha was Spider-Man on the wall. I mean, she, like, flew up the wall. I couldn't believe it. You know, Tasha's, like, tall and lanky, so she, like, flew up the wall, and here I'm struggling to get up, and, you know, I'm sweating like crazy. And, you know, talking about, it was like, the worst date idea I'd ever come up with, all right? It was just brutal on my ego, right? And so, but I remember at the end of the date, you know, my hands from, from holding on to the rocks, my hands were, like, were like all curled up and, like very sore and, 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 not, and I was just exhausted. My legs from trying to climb were just so tired. And, and, and reading this story, I think about this. Can you imagine fighting after, fight, having a sword fight after climbing a cliff? But that's the picture of what it's all about. It's not looking for the easy way out. It's an all-out assault. It's not taking the path of least resistance. It's committing to the path of greatest glory. And that usually means the more difficult and dangerous option available. It's the difference between letting things happen and making things happen. Oh, man, that's good. That's worth a retweet right there, right? It's the difference between letting things happen and making things happen. I think as Christ followers, as Jesus followers, man, that's something that God calls us to do. It's not the call to be normal and have the same, uh, this safe life. But it's this idea that we want to make things happen. It's playing offense with our life. Jonathan knew that if he pulled off this against all odds upset, God would get all the glory. So what motivated Jonathan? What triggered the 20 seconds of insane courage? What took, the, took away his fear and fueled his faith? What gave him the courage to climb the cliff? Well, it's impossible to psychoanalyze someone who lived thousands of years ago. But, but one statement in this scripture, in this passage of scripture, kind of gives us an insight to Jonathan's M.O., you know, his modus operandi. It's the key code in his operating system. It's one of my favorite sentences in, in all of scripture. As a matter of fact, it's become one of our, our core values at Chi Alpha, at our, our, our ministry there in Jogja. One statement reveals everything I need to know about the person of Jonathan. It says this in the scriptures. Verse 6 says this. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Man, I love that. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. <laughs> if we're honest here this morning, I think most of us live with the opposite mentality, right? Like, perhaps the Lord will not act on our behalf. You know, we live out of this, this fear like, man, should I take that step of faith? Well, what if God doesn't show up? You know, perhaps God will not act. What if God doesn't show up? What if God doesn't help me out in this situation? I think more of us live with that kind of mentality. But Jonathan, I love this passage of Scripture because he says, perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. He doesn't let fear dictate his decisions Instead, he lives by faith. So often, many of us end up living under the pomegranate tree on the outskirts of Gibeah. Our lack of courage is really a lack of faith. Instead of playing to win, too many of us, we play, to, we play not to lose. Cliff climbers would rather fall on their face than sit on their butt. They'd rather make mistakes than miss opportunities. Cliff climbers know that one step of faith can create the tipping point that not only changes their destiny, but the course of history. And that's precisely what happens in the wake of Jonathan's bold move. The story ends. So on that day, the Lord saved Israel. All it took was one daring decision. And that's all it ever takes in our lives. The longest regrets are the regrets of indecision, right? The hardest regrets that we carry are the regrets of inaction. The things we could have done, the things we would have done, the things we should have done, but we didn't do. Why? Because you'll never know. 
those regrets haunt us until the day we die. But this could be your day, friends, where you make the decision to take that step of faith, that insane step of courage that God is calling you to make that decision this morning. And all it takes is one defining decision. My one point, my main point this morning is simply this. Quit living as if the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death. Quit living as if the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death. Let me conclude with three points of application. Don't get excited just because I say conclusion. You know I'm a preacher. That doesn't mean anything, right? All right. They'll be like, oh, good, he's almost done. We're going to get out and eat lunch early. No, 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 no. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. All right, so how do we avoid this idea that, the, that, that so many of us live with this idea that the, the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death? How do we live with this green light mentality of I'm going all in for Jesus, taking that step of faith, this, this 20 seconds of insane courage and faith? How do we live like that? Number one, pick a fight. Pick a fight. There are two kinds of people in this world. Those who ask why and those who ask why not. Going all in with Jesus is this idea of saying, why not? Why, people? They like to make excuses. Now, don't point to the person next to you and be like, yeah, I know that person right there, all right? No, no, no. Why, people, are always looking for excuses of, of, of how come we can't do that? Oh, we don't have enough resources. We don't have enough. We, we can't do that. Why not, people? are always looking for opportunities. Why not try something new? Why not take this step of faith? Why, people? are always afraid of making mistakes. Why not people don't want to miss out on God-ordained opportunities? Somebody made an offhanded comment to me a, 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 few, a few years ago that's really changed my life. He, he challenged me to pick a fight. He said to me, if, Jamie, if, if, if you shut down your ministry and, and move back to America, if you, know, you, if you left Jokja, would anybody even notice? Would the city officials of, of Joe Jakarta even, even care if you shut down your English center and move back to America? Man, when he said that, that really, that really make me, made me step back and think, huh, of course people would miss us. We've got great friends and university students involved with what we're doing. But I thought, you know what, there's, there's no real big social impact that we're making. So from that moment on, we began to pray and look for ways that we could be a blessing to the community in the city of Jokja. And so right away we looked across the street from our English center and there's a, there's a, a center for un, un, under-resourced children there. And so we, start, we started uh, partnering with them and I've got access to hundreds of university students, some of the brightest students in Indonesia. And so, so now we've engaged these, these under-resourced, these poor children and we're doing weekly tutoring with these kids. And so my goal after hearing that from this, per, this challenge to pick a fight a few years ago, is our vision and our goal for our English center is that someday the Sultan of Jokja will come to our English center and thank us for being there. And say thank you that, that you guys have, have, have developed this English program and are helping the under-resourced kids of Jokja. That's our vision. I think it would be so cool to have the Sultan come to our English center. You know, how cool would that be? And I was thinking about you guys this morning. Man, if your business shut down, you know, granted, people would be sad, they might lose their jobs, but would there be any social impact because of your business shutting down? Or if you move from your per Perumahan or your, your neighborhood to a different house, would your neighbors be upset that you're leaving because you've made such an impact and impression on their life? What are you living for? What kind of impact are you having on those around you? What fight do you need to pick? What cause do you need to stand up for? This is what Jonathan did. He picked the fight with the Philist Philistines. He was tired of backing down, so he stood up. He was tired of playing defense, so he decided to go on the offense. What fight do you need to pick? So many times I meet with, in, with, with young people in our, in our work, and, and I'll say, hey, what's your, what's your major? And they'll tell me management. And I'll say, oh, man, that's great. What, what, kind, of, what kind of management do you want to go into? And they look at me so strange, they say, uh, uh, managing people. You know, they're, I'm like, don't you have anything more aspiring, like a, a, a field of expertise or work that you want to go into? And they're like, no, just management. I just want a job. That's all I want. You know? So like, I talk to a lot of people. They'll say, my, my, my degree is business. Oh, really? What kind of business? 
any kind of business that makes money. You know, that's all I'm looking for. And I, and I got to think, you know, guys, there's got to be more to this life than just wanting to get a job and having a career and making some money. Man, what kind of impact are you having? I look around our world and I see plenty of fights for us to pick, plenty of real purpose to live for, the lack of quality education all throughout the rural parts of Indonesia, corruption that's so pervasive, the lack of clean drinking water, human trafficking and sexual slavery, poverty, the sharing Jesus with, with, with someone who's never even heard of him, moving to the more difficult areas of Indonesia to bring about economic uh, uh, um, success there. What fight do you need to pick? Number two, pick a fight. Number two, play offense with your life. Play offense. If, if you're around me for very long, you'll realize that, man, I'm always moving forward. I'm always coming up with new ideas, you know, uh, that, that I'm always thinking of the next creative step that, that we need to take. And really, um, somebody said to me, Jamie, your mentality is this, ready, fire, aim, <laughs> all right? And then I like that. Instead of seeing it as an insult, I was like, yeah, you know what? That's true. That's the mentality that I want to live with, this ready, fire fire aim. Because if I, if I have to wait until I have all the financial resources and all the people lined up to succeed, where's my trust in God? You know, that's never going to happen where I finally feel like I'm confident enough that I've got everything I need. That's not a step of faith. I want to live with this idea that ready, fire, aim. That I want to be able to go for it. We'll never have enough human resources or financial resources to do what God has called us to do. And if we do, our dream is too small. Man, if you guys think my preaching is bad in English, you should hear me in Indonesian, all right? But, you know, like I can remember when I first arrived in Indonesia and I started studying the Indonesian language, uh, I preached my first sermon in Indonesia, uh, in, 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 in Bahasa, Indonesia, after five months of living here. Kasihan jama'at itu. Yeah, yeah, they had to suffer through my terrible Indonesian. You know, I'm making mistakes like who knows? was what I was saying, all right? And I can remember, though, it was in central Java, you know, so, you know, the Javanese, so many Javanese people are so, so pan, you know, they're so polite, and so I remember standing at the exit of the church building that morning after preaching a terrible sermon, uh, and, and all of the Bapa and Ibu are saying to me, you know, like, oh, Jamie, sangat lancha, sudah pintar dalam bahasa Indonesia, you know, shaking my hand, and, and I knew they were lying, you know, I knew it was terrible, right? But, you know, I had this decision, I was like, you know what? I'm going to choose to believe them, right? You know, you know I am smart. I am Lachar. This is awesome. So, you know, I kind of like fed my ego a little bit here and them. And I knew it was terrible, but I realized early on that if I waited to start preaching and teaching in Bahasa, man, my Bahasa will never be as good as a native speaker, will never be as good as someone who's grown up speaking it. So there came a point where I just have to just go for it, where I just have to burbahasa Indonesia, or I just have to start speaking in Indonesian. I can remember my neighbor uh, when I first moved to Indonesia. I just learned a, a, a couple of new vocabulary words, and, and she was sick. And so I decided, you know what, I'm going to go pray for her. She didn't know Jesus, so I, I introduced her to Jesus by saying, hey, you know, I believe that Jesus can heal you can I pray for you? And she's like, oh, yes, you know, I believe that God can heal me. I'm like, yes, so, so I'm going to pray in the name of Jesus. And she agreed that I could pray for her. And so I prayed for her. And so the next day I see her. And I wanted to say to her, you know, I, I wanted to ask her, Masi Sakit, you know, like, are you, are, are you still sick or are you, or are you healed? But, I, but I'd gotten a couple words confused. And instead of saying Sakit, you know, are you still sick? I started asking her, are you still Sombong? You know, I started, you know, like, Masi Sombong. And she's like looking at me strange. I go, okay, I'll check on you tomorrow. Besok sai check lagi, you know. And so I come back the next day, I'm like, Masi Sombong. And she's like, what are you talking about? You know, and it wasn't until about a week of this uh, uh, that finally my neighbor, not my neighbor, my, our helper, she's like, you know, I think you're trying to say Masi Sakit. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, no. You know, like, what a huge mistake to make. I'm like, what do you know? Like, I'm, but, you know, I was thinking, you know, like that is, that is, uh, uh, that, that's this idea of ready, fire, aim, you know, that I'm just going to go for it and allow God to, 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 to work the miracles, to to fill in the gaps where I am not able to. 2,000 years ago, Jesus said go, and we've been given that green light to go for it. Number three, take a stand. Take a stand. Let's 
you know, you got to pick a fight. You've got to play offense with your life. And eventually you just got to stand up for something. You got to go for it. Don't let what you cannot do keep you from doing what you can do. Man, I'm on fire this morning. Good job, Jamie. Thanks, Jamie. Don't let what you cannot do keep you from doing what you can do. Man, I'm, if you're around me for any length of time, you'll realize that I'm passionate about sharing my, my relationship with Jesus to the unchurched, to people who don't know him yet. And I, and I don't let the fact that there are millions of people hundreds of thousands of university students in Jokja keep me from reaching the people I can reach. I don't look at it this overwhelming problem like, man, I can't reach all of Jokja. I understand I can't do that, but I can reach some. About 10 months ago, a girl named Lily, through some supernatural uh, circumstances, got involved in our community, our, our, our community of young people. and She started coming and hanging out. Little by little, she started on her spiritual journey of discovering how God created her and, and who she is. Uh, and, and I can remember after about six months, a few months ago, sitting down with her. We had a private moment before our large group gathering. And, and I said, hey, Lily, can I kind of share you something from this, the Kitab Suchi, something from the scriptures that's very important to me? Since we're friends, she's like, absolutely, Jamie. So I sit down with her and I walk her through what's called the Romans Road. You know, these five passages of scripture from, from Romans. And I, and I start walking through her, how, uh, you know, the salvation plan and Jesus. When I get to verse, uh, Romans 10, verse 13, I'm sitting with her privately and I say, and I read that verse that says, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I said, Lily, when, when I read that, you know, in the Alkitab it says, Barang Siapa or Siapa Barang? I forget now. All right, you guys got to help me out here, all right? Some of you can speak, right? Um, so, so, you know, but it says, help me out here. Barang Siapa, all right, okay, good, all right, all right. Yeah, it's a, just a Bible quiz. I, I knew it, I was just testing you guys. All right, good job, you passed, all right. So, it says, whoever, anyone who calls upon the name, does that just mean only Americans who call upon the name? No way. Only Bule? No way. Only Orang Batak? No way. Only Chin or Orang China? No way. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. Does that include you, Lily? Lily's starting to tear up. She realizes what's happening. We begin to sense the Holy Spirit's presence there. Anyone who calls on Jesus shall be saved. Lily, what, what will you be saved from? And because we'd read those earlier passages of Scripture, she looks at me with revelation in her eyes. Death and hell. So now with tears in her eyes, I ask her the simple question. Lily, are you ready to call upon the name of the Lord? She looks up at me. Tears in her eyes. She says, not yet. <laughs> you guys thought I was going to say something different, right? <laughs> so yeah, I wish it was that simple, right? Anybody who's shared their faith is like, yes. Oh no, it's not that easy, right? No way. She, she says, not yet. She's like, not yet. I was like, that's okay, Lily, because now you understand that, that you don't need a pastor. You could be anywhere at any time, and when you're ready to call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved from death and hell. Six days later, she texts me. She's like, Jamie, we've got to meet. i got to talk to you. And so, so I'm like, absolutely, let's meet. She comes into the English Center, and we sit down privately again. She goes, I don't know what you said to me last week, but every time I go to pray, all I can do is think about Jesus. What is going on? And I say, Lily, can I share a story with you? She's like, absolutely. I say, I say, Jesus tells this story in the scriptures, in the Kitab Suchi. Jesus tells this story of a shepherd who has these 99 sheep. And one day the shepherd is counting his sheep and he's caring for them. And so, so he counts them all. And, and this one day he counts them and he's going 95, 96, 97, 98, 99. And he realizes he's one short. And he realizes that one of his sheep is missing. And so the, the, the good shepherd, he begins to, to go out into the field and, and he starts searching for that, that, that missing sheep and, and he's yelling out, Lily, where are you? Lily, where are, Lily, where are you? And when he finds Lily, when he finds that missing sheep, he embraces the sheep because he knows what was lost is now found. And Lily knew where I was going with this. And again begins to tear up. I say, Lily, Jesus is calling out to you. He's calling out to you, Lily, Lily, where are you? 
Tonight, Lily, are you ready to be found? And at that moment, Lily nodded with agreement and says, yes. Yes, I'm ready for Jesus to find me. I'm ready to commit my life to Jesus. And later that night, because Lily has no church background, she doesn't know all the, the Christian words and the church lingo that we like to use, you know, like that she's been redeemed or saved by the blood of the Lamb. You know, she doesn't know any of that kind of stuff. She just turned to my wife and said, Tasha, tonight, Jesus found me. <laughs> and I love that. Jesus found her. I don't let the fact that there are hundreds of thousands of university students that I can't reach keep me from reaching those that I can. Let's not let what we can, cannot do keeping, keep us from doing what we can do. Let me bring it a little closer to home. Whom do you need to stand up for? What do you need to do? What fight do you need to pick? Do you need to start working with the homeless or the fatherless or the voiceless or the lost? Take the first step. It may feel overwhelming and a huge challenge, but don't let what you cannot do keep you from doing what you can do. Take the first step this morning. Climb the cliff. Pick the fight. Play offense. Take a stand. Quit living as if the purpose of life was to arrive safely at death. And perhaps, perhaps the Lord will work on your behalf.